Well, welcome again to another episode of the, I should just about to say the Urban Burner, of um, in, Conserv- in, in Conservation With. I've got myself all muddled up there. In Conservation With. You're with David Lindo, also known as the Urban Burner. Tonight, my guest is Dr. Amy Jane Beer. And that's if you're naughty. If, if you're a nice person, you can just call her Amy. Um, and we're going to be talking about Rivers and her book, which um, unfortunately I've got, I haven't got a proper copy of it, but the flow is out now. It's getting rave reviews, and if you haven't got a copy, you shouldn't be here. You should be out in the shop buying one now before you come back to to watch the rest of this program. But anyway, welcome along. Um, before we get into our conversation, I must quickly um, say a few words um, for our sponsors on the behalf of our sponsors. Tonight we're sponsored by Leica Sport Optics and also CJ Wildlife, who are a team of passionate nature lovers and experts in garden wildlife uh, on a mission to make nature accessible for everyone. Whether you are a nature novice or a garden guru, they want to inspire, educate and provide the right tools to help wildlife thrive on your doorstep. So those are the guys and thank you very much for the sponsorship. Now, Amy Jane Beer um, is a woman that actually holds the record on In Conservation With for being on this particular series more times than anyone else. She's been on, this is her third time, and every time she comes, I'm just, I'm even more excited to receive her because I think she's, you know, her and I, we, we get, I've only met you once, haven't I, Amy? In real life, yeah, I've only had one chance to squeeze you. <laughs> We've only met once, but every time I meet Amy online, it's like, let's just sit down and chat and chew the chew the fat, you know, and that's how it feels tonight. I was saying previously before we started recording that I could have been out partying and suddenly come in and turn on recording and then we can be just talking because I wouldn't, you know, I just feel as if I can just get on a level with her straight away. But for those who don't know Amy Jane Bear, she's a biologist turned naturalist and writer. She's worked on more than, tw- uh, sorry, for more than 20 years as a science writer and editor, contributing to more than 40 books on natural history. She writes for The Guardian, uh, British Wildlife and BBC Wildlife magazines, amongst others. She sits on the steering group of the environmental arts charity, New Networks for Nature, and the conservation steering group of the Castle Howard Estate. And also you are involved with the Right to Roam scenario, aren't you? I am, yeah. If you can just quickly expand on that Right to Roam business. Um, So the Right to Roam campaign has been running for a couple of years now. It it launched officially in um, 2020 um, off the back of two really important books, um, one by Guy Shrobsoll called Who Owns England, which sort of lifted the lid on the extraordinarily skewed pattern of land ownership in this country. Um, And Nick Hayes' The Book of Trespass, um, which is the sort of the history of how we came to into that that's this weird property situation where we are excluded from from that which for so much of our history was ours was common um the land and the rivers of this country um and guy and nick had, had hooked up in the process of writing their books and decided that something needed to be done about this so they, they started the right to roam campaign um which Um, Hopefully, lots of you have heard of some of our our actions over the last couple of years involving mass trespasses and generally raising the raising the issue and sort of um, emphasizing how much we need access to nature, how important it is for our physical and mental well-being um, and how access to nature um, fosters the love and the care that that we need to get ourselves out of this series of environmental crises that we're facing. So it's very much a, 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 a sort of wildlife-led, um, nature-loving organisation with um, which regards humans as part of nature um, and a part of it that can play a, a very a much more active role in um, in fixing it. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's it's amazing how conditioned we are when it comes to you know this this whole thing about right the right to roam because you always feel I can't go there because there's a fence there. You know, you feel like you can't go places. And it's interesting because I went to um, the Faroe Islands um, a few years ago and I was told by my guide, go anywhere you want. You can even walk in people's gardens. And I was like, really? And I remember walking down the street, this one street in this one horse town, basically. 
and I was trying to look for birds and I was looking in someone's garden and I was just too nervous to step into his garden. I just stood at the edge of the street looking into the garden and then this huge man, this quite handsome man actually, muscular guy, young, in, probably in his early 40s, he said to me, what are you doing? And I said, uh, I, I'm looking for birds. He said, well, when you finished, come in and have a cup of tea. <laughs> I thought that's how it should be. That's how this world should be. We should be able to just stroll around and obviously within reason, but stroll around and just enjoy what's around us. So yeah, wish- absolutely. Within reason is, is what we're what we're asking for. We're, we're not asking for access to people's gardens um, unless your garden happens to be, you know, thousands of acres. Um, <laughs> We're asking for something more in line with um, the Scandinavian picture or the Scottish picture, although less extensive than the, the rights they have. The freedom to roam, you know, just north of the border um, here in Scotland, um, where they have um, a, a code of conduct that everyone's expected to abide by. So it's a, a codified right of responsible access to, to the land, um, not including the, the, the immediate surrounds of people's private homes. Um, so everyone's entitled to their privacy, but we'd we'd like access to to particularly to to green belts, to downland, to rivers, and to woodland, um, as a way of <clears throat> a relationship with nature and, and creating a a more engaged, more caring, um, healthier society. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm I'm based in Extremadura in Spain, southwest Spain, and what I found really fascinating here is that you can go. Well, practically anywhere. I mean, especially um, even on farmers' land. You know, you can get in your car and just drive. I mean, obviously using the tracks, not over fields, but you can actually go in people's farms. You can never do that in the UK. And also around the reservoirs, there's tracks all around. So it's like you can be on safari. And I come back to England, and sometimes I get, you know, suddenly, oh, I can't do that. I just remember I can't actually drive down there or walk down this path because, um, you know, it's restricted. But anyway, we are here to talk about, um, principally about rivers. Um, but before we do, I just want to, because people talk about eco, uh, eco anxiety, and I, I think I'm, I didn't think I had that, but I think I do in a way, because, you know, I've just been watching the results of the COP out 27, um, and the fact that people are mouthing all these words about yes we must do this and do that but no one's actually doing anything or very little or the very min the, the barest minimum so what can we what, what what's your thoughts amy in terms of where we're at where we're at in the moment in in the world and what's what's i don't know i just i feel a bit anxious about all of this and i need to talk to you scary place. yeah we are we are in a scary place um and anyone that's not anxious isn't paying attention, I think. Um, but it's really important that we don't let that anxiety paralyze us um, and that we keep not only hope, but keep a, um, a sort of positive approach. Um, humans are the most collaborative species that's, that's ever evolved. Um, we have it in our capacity to, to change and to fix things and to make um the world a, a more stable place in the future not only for our our own descendants um but also for the other um species that we we share this extraordinary as far as we know it unique planet with um so yeah so chin up is what, what i generally try to try to say um there are things we can do and taking action is a much better way of facing a crisis than than just sitting there waiting for your know, giving up you know the anxiety is paralyzing but um or you know runs the risk of being paralyzing but um but we need to act and where our governments where our leaders where our um industries aren't doing enough then you know it, it's us that has to tell them that um i'm hugely disappointed that the um people's walk for wildlife the second people's walk for wildlife that was due to happen this coming weekend has been postponed to next year um it uh, it will be the, the second, we, we did one in 2018, Chris Packham organised that, and it was very much organised by all independent voices, um, really so that um, Chris's, Chris's sort of stipulation was that we all should speak as we find um, and not be sort of held back by um, 
a an institution or a, or an organization or viewpoint that we had to you know parrot um this one um is happening as a response to the attack on nature um that 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 became you know that came to a head during the short-lived disastrous Liz Trust premiership um and some of those um those immediate threats appear to have receded in the hands of of her successor um but uh, but we are still one of the most nature depleted nations on the planet um we're still facing the the bonfire of huge huge numbers of um environmental protective laws um next year um you know, we're still heading very much in the wrong direction in terms of um, looking after our our wildlife. So um, the the, the mobilisation that that was apparent um, in the, the sort of more extreme face of, of that threat a couple of months ago um, that needs to continue. Um, and I really hope that the big NGOs do um, come good on this. Um, they're saying they just want the event postponed to early next year when there there isn't a rail strike. And more people can get there um but with with longer to prepare it needs to be bigger <laughs> um so my concern is that we lose momentum um so any of you that are here and if you know keep an eye out for the date it's not been set yet but if you can come please do because it really does matter the you know talking about how finding a voice and basically standing up and saying this isn't right what's your feeling regarding the current methods that some voices of views, i.e., you know, glue and and soup and stuff like that. Do you think that that's, that message will get through or do you think that's going to aggravate not only the people that they are trying to aggravate, but also the people they're trying to get on board? Um, I, I think it's, uh, what's the word, commensurate with the crisis, um, with the crisis we're facing. Um, we have, you know, the the message isn't getting through, so we need to try everything until it does. Um, and with the uh, the recent um, crime bill and the and the policing bill um, ramping down on the, the ways we can protest, we have to get more creative with it. Um, and those people who are brave enough to to take action that's likely going to end up in their arrest, um, if not their imprisonment, um, that's a measure of how um how desperate they are um and yeah i support them um we're going to face a lot more inconvenience than than being you know being late for appointments or whatever as a as a species not just as a society and as in individuals um so i think it i think it is proportionate um and we can we can be creative it's not for everybody not everyone's going to want to chain themselves to something glue themselves to something or sit in the middle of a road um or strip naked or, or almost naked as, as as hannah did last last week um but you know they it is getting attention um and it is a, it's just a measure of how strongly people feel yeah it's just getting it getting the attention is this is the is the issue really because i just despair when i see people i remember being in london a couple of weeks ago and standing on or sitting at the cafe actually and i noticed a woman walk past and she just quite happily opened up her rizzlers and just dropped the package in the floor the reason why i couldn't even say anything to her is because i was on, on a call at the time and i couldn't you know she did it before i could even say anything she'd already walked past me but it's things like like that people are i find are still thinking or they, they, you get the impression that they think well that's an issue over there it doesn't involve me you know this isn't what i do every day what am I going to be able to do to to affect anything anyway? So you know, let them get on with it, kind of thing. And it's getting to those people, which is so important. That's why I hope the Walk for Nature um, reaches out for more people um, to come along to it. Um, the first one I thought you know was great, but I felt that if I'm honest, I felt that the um, the social media they did for it. Um, they were speaking to the wrong people. I felt that the people who's been spoken to were already the conservationists that you'd expect to see. And often I'd see people in the background and I'd be thinking, I want to be hearing what that person has to say, because that person doesn't look like someone who's going to be, you know, lying in front of a train or what have you. You need to talk to, to get people outside of the circle involved, 
so that the people outside will think, oh, and actually, you know, there's someone like me there. It's that representation thing again, I think, personally. Mm. Mm. I think that's true. I think we don't have strong enough um, lobbying powers. I don't think, you know, I don't think our our uh, opinions are echoing down the halls of Whitehall, the corridors of Whitehall. I don't think Westminster are um, concerned enough by the environment lobby, um, which is weird because there are millions of us, um, you know, far more members of, of environmental organisations than there are of political parties. Um, so it's the lack of mobilisation of uh, the millions, even the tens of millions possibly in, in this country that do care. Um, but most of them are kind of normal, moderate people with lots of concerns. Um, and they may not be listing wildlife, nature, the environment in their top as their absolute top priority. Their top priority at the moment is probably the cost of living. Um, maybe the education of their children, maybe the security of their jobs. Um, and these are kind of, uh, there are so many immediate threats. Recently, you know, COVID was, was the immediate threat. Um, and yet the, the, the climate and biodiversity crises, these are you know, truly existential threats uh, on a scale of, that, that dwarfs anything else, but they're just a little bit at remove. Um, and I think possibly the penny's dropping that, you know, this, these crises are coming for us. It's not just going to be um, you know, people living elsewhere in more kind of vulnerable parts of the world that are, that are suffering, um, you know, it's, it's coming for all of us. Um, so I think the young the younger generations who have so much more skin in the game are, um, are the ones that are generally leading. Um, and yeah, we need to be listening to them. Do you think we've become a bit numb as a nation? We're just numb to it all. You know, I know that, for example, nature may not be high in people's lists, even though it should be priority. But the cost of living crisis, for example, I would have thought maybe 40 years ago or, or longer ago, people would be on the streets in their thousands, you know, almost on a daily basis. You know, I think back to the poll tax rights, for example. And now I see a situation where I don't know whether the media are not actually covering it and you don't sort of get to hear it. So therefore you don't think it's happening. So therefore people just think, well, nothing's happening. So what am I going to do about it? Or is it genuinely a case that we are becoming more placid because of restrictions on us and you know the fact that they're trying to criminalize, criminalize the idea of getting together in groups and, and, and protesting. I think you've hit the nail on the head talking about the media. I mean so much of the media is in the pockets of a few people with you know with their own agenda. Um, and they they are dictating the um the opinions of you know they're manipulating the opinions of millions and millions of people um and possibly sort of hypnotizing us with a with a diet of celebrity and um and gossip and and hate a lot of the time actually against the the other um whoever that might be um so yeah i think everything we can do to kind of heal communities to stitch people together um, um and by community i don't just mean actually people i mean you know people and people and nature i regard us all as part of you know an ecological community okay um let's talk about your book the flow i mean i've i've written a couple of books but looking at your work uh, and, and and this book in particular i think myself oh, i wish i could write something like this i mean it's very it's eclectic there's lots of emotion in there there's there's there's, there's fact and there's also you're left kind of thinking i want to i want to go to these places i want to actually try and see what you saw um congratulations number one i mean i remember speaking to you when you were writing this so this is um a, a very great achievement um and if you haven't got it as i said please go and get it definitely um but let's let's talk about the essence of it i mean firstly i mean I've, the, if you read the cover note at the back it talks about the fact that you lost your beloved friend in 2012 um so that was a, a real sort of uh sort of moment for you in terms of moving forward in a different direction yeah it, it did change everything for for the 10 years up to 2012, I'd been um, very keen whitewater kayaker. Um, most of my life 
um, and that of my a, a close knit group of friends revolved around when we could paddle. Um, it was something that we did, you know, we every weekend, um, particularly in the winter when there was you know, plenty of plenty of rain, plenty of water in the rivers. Um, sometimes on the, you know on a weeknight, if there was if there was a lot of rain, we'd we'd be out because um, you wait wait for the rivers to come up, and some rivers you could only paddle when the water levels were right. You know, rivers change hugely depending on how much water's in them. So my relationship for riv with rivers for those years was was one of adventure, adrenaline. Um, it was thrilling. Um, in a kayak, we were able to get to places that you can't access any other way and saw places that were extraordinarily beautiful. Um, so the, the, the sense of place was always very strong. Um, encounters with wildlife were always part of it, but I wouldn't say... Um, I couldn't say honestly that that was, you know, that that was why I did it. I did it for the thrill um, and the sort of sense of achievement that comes from um, honing a skill, um, looking after yourself. So, um, so yeah, you know, we, we would see wildlife. I would see, you know, dippers and kingfishers and and the occasional leaping fish and um, mayflies, that sort of thing. But it was all sort of in passing as we as we kind of sped by, um, and then uh, yeah. That all changed. It was starting to change anyway because we'd had we'd, we'd started having children. Um, so I had a um, young son. Kate had a young daughter, um, and various other of our friends had had young children as well. So we were starting to find it harder to fit in kayaking around parenthood. Um, but then, um, yeah, when Kate died, it 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 changed. You know, we'd, we'd always been very aware of risk. We'd always managed risk through lots of training, lots of practice of rescue techniques. You know, no one, no one, no one took safety lightly. Um, and kayaking actually um, statistically is, is much less risky than, than running even. Um, running, cycling, horse riding all carry far greater risk um, per hour of activity than, um, than what, what kayaking does. Um, but um, accidents happen, you know, whatever, whatever your, you know, activity is, it's probably, conceivably possible to have some kind of fatal accident playing tiddlywinks I don't know but there's risk in what in, in life generally um but yeah um losing Kate in that in that way um particularly when I was a relatively new mum and very sort of, yeah, I had a new concept of risk and what you know what me not being there might mean for my son um yeah it, it just made it incredibly difficult um I did try to get back in the boat a few times, but I just found I couldn't do it. Um, and so I stayed away from rivers and particularly whitewater rivers almost completely for about, about seven years. And then pretty much by chance, I just happened to be in the vicinity of the Rawthy, the river where, where Kate died. Um, and, and I went to find the rapid. Um, yeah nearly seven years after after she'd gone and found myself not with a sense of sort of I don't know closure or anything like that just with a sense of god I miss this so much it was such a beautiful river um and seeing the rapid was awful but the but the stillness of the pool below um I spent quite a lot of long time there just sitting and watching the light um, and the strange um, dyers and currents in the water and just seeing tiny features that I never would have noticed as I as I whizzed by in my kayak. Um, and the scent of it, the sound of it, the taste of it, just the multi-sensory um, immersion that you have in being in a, in a place like that. Um, it just absolutely resonated um, through my soul. And I just thought, what, what am I doing? Staying away from these places that have meant so much to me. Um, and what did I miss um, in all those years? So I just made a decision to go back and, and re-engage with, not just with Whitewater Rivers, but with, with all rivers and find out what, you know, what they might mean. Um, there's something about a river that is, is very connecting, not just, not just the way it connects, you know, areas of landscape, um, but they connect communities, they, they connect time in a way, past and present. There's, there's this sort of um, 
this ancient quality to water. You know, it's the same old water that's been going round on Earth for four billion years, um, just being endlessly recycled. Um, and yeah, I just had a sense of this water's going somewhere. And when you think about where it's going, follow it in your mind, you realise that the river doesn't end. The, the water flows downstream into the sea, but it's the same water. It gets evaporated into the atmosphere and there are rivers up there too. Um, they're, they're just rivers of vapour instead of rivers of liquid water. Um, it gets rained down somewhere. It might, might flow straight into a river. It might flow deep underground and stay there for a million years. Um, but it's the same stuff. Sooner or later, it will come back into a river and yeah I just I just had this sudden this sudden sort of sense of the the vastness of it all and the cyclicity of it all and I found that quite comforting that's a long answer sorry <laughs> well I love it I love it I mean you know I as a kid I remember when I when I thought about rivers and when I went to Scotland for the first time as a 13 year old and saw those wild rivers and I was thinking how can they be replenished the whole time. Well, how come it never runs dry? It just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing. But then I think to myself, especially, you know, when I got older, I thought to myself, how many people walking down this street in Bristol or in, in, in Birmingham or London or Edinburgh, how many people actually think about rivers? How many people actually know any rivers apart from like in London, the Thames? You know, I, don't, I think people, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but are people kind of disconnected? I mean, they're disconnected from nature, but are they disconnected from the idea of a river as well? Extraordinarily so. You know, our main relationship with the river now is when we turn on tap or when we flush the toilet. Um, you know, that's, that's still the river. That's still a continuous um, part of this system of water flowing over and through and around the planet. Um, and... You know, in this country particularly, it's no surprise that we're disconnected from rivers because we only have access to 3% of them. Um, so everyone lives close to a river. You know, we're all in a river catchment. Um, and hydrologists regard, you know, you can ask a question about what is a river. And, and from a hydrological point of view, a river is the whole catchment because there's water trickling through the ground and through the, 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 the plants and um, all on its way under gravity. Um, into, into the river channel so we just we, we can't just think about the water that's flowing in the channel we have to think about the, the whole system um and we're so unaware of that um like that, the, the one sort of insight that i had that, that this sort of realization of how connected it all was um that really struck me in the in the writing of the book and if the book can do anything um i would like it to just reconnect us with that system um our ancestors used to think about it a lot um and they before they understood the hydrological cycle or the science of it they had their own answers for you know why the why, where the water came from and why it kept coming um and they used to invoke um magic or deities or 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 spirits um, um most of which were feminine um there's a strong link between um water and and the divine feminine and the, the fertility that water brings people will be aware that you know the floods that happened would bring would bring not only much needed water to the land they would bring nutrients um so there was rich farmland alongside rivers so they didn't they didn't fear flooding in the same way that we do you know regular seasonal inundation was just part of a natural cycle um but then we tried to find ways of just controlling our rivers um, we use them for power, for, for um, political power as, as boundaries, uh, um, but also for, um, for energetic power to, to drive mills and to drive, um, the, drive industry. Um, we started using them to, um, to take away our waste, started polluting them. They got um, contaminated, so we blocked them in. We, we um, culverted them. We built up the, the banks to stop them flooding, to try and control, control, control. Um, and, you know, losing Kate in that way taught me that you can't control water. Um, actually, when it comes down to it, water, water will always win. Um, water will win life. 
<laughs> is that you, David? <laughs> no, sorry, I, I, I'm trying to turn my, my face time off. I'm very sorry about this. Um, water will win against, against you know, a, a, a human life, a human trapped in it, but water will also win against a mountain. And given time, it will just wear that away. So, um, so yeah, our, our efforts to control and contain the flow, we're always going to come unstuck. You're on mute. <laughs> Your book's a very emotional journey around the rivers of the UK. Just, do you know how many rivers they are in the UK? Is it possible to quantify that? Um, I think it would depend how you counted them. I mean, if you count every every beck and rill and stream and brook and tributary, because um, they all have different names, far from the same flow has more than one name as it flows from parish to parish, quite a lot of the, the small flows up here. You know, they'll have they'll have dozens of names um, as they flow from one parish to the next. Um, so it would just entirely depend how you how you counted. But there are a lot. There's a fantastic um, GIS where um, geographic information systems where 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 maps are digital maps. You can you can create layers where you you just see um, different kinds of features. So you can select just to see the rivers. Um, and you see this extraordinary network in which the country looks like a, a lung almost, you know, penetrated by, by thousands and thousands of these capillary like flows. Um, areas where there aren't so many, they tend to be the chalk, the chalk uplands, which chalk being very permeable, the water tends to, to go underground. Um, also limestone, um, which is soluble. So again, very, um, very easily hollowed out by water, so the rivers tend to be underground there. Yeah. But um, I think the one behind me is a limestone one, I think. Is that right? Is sorry? It, the one behind me looks like a limestone river as well. It's actually in Slovenia. Yeah, is that, is that the uh, the Socha? Uh, I can't remember. Might be. It looks like a lot of rivers and seen a lot of land, and I can't I've remember. I've that. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, when we spoke, I mean, obviously, well, Maybe people don't know, but you are very much an aquatic woman. Um, um, whenever I look at your social media, you're normally dipped into some river somewhere. And two things. Firstly, I can't go anywhere near a river in terms of being in a river. And there's some beautiful rivers. I've been invited into many rivers um, and I've turned down every single invitation because I just have this feeling that I don't really want to be in there. I don't mind being on it, but not in it. And I've been talking to a couple of my friends uh, before talking to you and and they're all interested in wild swimming and they all jump into the sea in Hastings and Hove and places like that. Um, and I get the feeling that, and you mentioned it earlier a couple of times, or by inference anyway, that it seems to be a very feminine thing to, to want to jump into rivers. Um, most of the people I know who wild swim, for example, are, are, are women. I don't think I know any men actually. Um, most people, yeah, most people I see are women. Is that something that I've imagined or is there any truth in that assumption? Um, plenty of men do do well, so of course they do, but I think it is, yeah, it is something that women have embraced. Um, I think, so scientifically, I think it's, it's established that women generally have a slightly higher tolerance for the cold water than men. Um, pain generally, actually, I think we're, I think we're a bit tougher. Um, but um, I think wild swimming and um, paddleboarding, interestingly, two two aquatic sports, um, both seem to appeal greatly to women. And um, I was talking to Jo Mosley, who's a paddleboarder. She'd written a guide to paddleboarding recently. She said something interesting that. Um, She's heard women say that because that's new, and I guess wild swimming, although we have been doing it for you know forever, that's that's the, the original swimming, it, it has sort of um it became much less popular for, for a few years. Um, and so the sort of the new wave of wild swimming um means that um there isn't or there wasn't this sort of stereotypical image of what a wild swimmer looked like. And I think women have kind of found that that helps because it means that um we're not coming at if you were a woman and you wanted to um you know when i was young if i'd been interested in football i wouldn't have been wouldn't have seen footballers that look like me um 
and that's the case for a lot of sports. Um, so I, I think women have always been just as adventurous as men, just as willing to push themselves. Um, but but image matters, um, and so what we see around us, the, the sort of stereotypical image of um, someone engaged in that sport or that activity, um, just creates the idea of you know, whether something is for you or not, whether people like you do that. Um, and that hasn't been the case with, with wild swimming. Um, but yeah, perhaps it goes back deeper than that. Perhaps it is related to this, this association with, 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 the, with the feminine um, that water has. Um, it's, it's something that um, is not competitive, don't, I mean that you can you can race as a swimmer, but for most people it's more um, recreational, therapeutic, um, almost spiritual for some people, and it's a it's a an activity that hugely boosts your mental health as well as your physical health. Um, it's good, great for your boosting your immune system, um, generally boosting your metabolism, increasing your resilience, um, and your confidence just so good in so many ways and those are all things that that perhaps have a feel a greater need for but how can you recognize a, a safe river i mean i look at some rivers and i think oh um i'm not going in there anyway how do you recognize a good river and also given that most of our rivers are polluted you know how do you well what do you do when you're in a river it's a really good question safety obviously really is important um I think any kind of activity that's seen as slightly out of the ordinary, if someone has an accident doing it, um, there is a temptation to sort of feel that, or maybe they were asking for it, that it was dangerous because it was different. Um, but the statistics don't really bear that out. It's all for when accidents happen. Um, and they do happen, you know, every year people, people drown in our rivers, um, whether they're there, purposely or whether you know they've or accidentally if they've, they've fallen in um so we should be prepared when you you know if you're wanting to get into a river then you need to have a think about it talk to people that do it regularly ideally go with someone else the first few few times um but yeah when rivers are you know in spate after heavy rain that's really not a good idea to be in them then when they're flowing fast you should know how deep it is you should know how fast it's flowing you should know what the bottom is like um and if it's cold and you know how cold it's going to be you know leaping in um particularly on a hot day often it's the shock of that cold that can get people into trouble whether it sparks a panic attack or even you know even worse a heart attack people you know the, the shock can do that so always sensible to get in slowly um introduce yourself slowly to the water um with someone um there to look after you um i do swim alone um now but i've been doing it for quite a long time um and and I do that in places that are um, familiar to me or settings that are very familiar to me. Um, in some of the, the smaller rivers where there's, you know, where there are, are waterfalls and cascades, which make a beautiful setting and it's very, you know, peeling and it's Instagrammable. Um, there's usually, they, they can be actually quite safe because they tend to be a kind of a pool arrangement where there'll be a deeper area, slower flowing area below a drop. Um, and then that often runs into a shallower area where you know you're unlikely to get swept downstream. So it's worth just just scoping it out first, um, just using your using your head. Yeah, because there's a, the romantic vision of you know walking along and you happen across this beautiful river, babbling, well maybe even Whitewater River, but there's a little area where it's calm, and you can jump from a boulder into the water, and you know. That frightens the hell out of me. You know, I've been in rivers or been, not in them, but along the a river and seen, you know, people sunbathing at the edge of it or swimming, but then you get, you know, normally men, boys, jumping from really ridiculous heights into an area which is probably just a very small area that's deep enough for them. And you just think there's an accident waiting to happen. There. And it kind of makes me think personally, I don't even get involved in the first place. And I don't, the invitation is not there for me at all. Mm -hmm. um yeah i would i wouldn't jump in unless i was very confident about the depth of the water um often there are very very deep pools under under cascades because the water's been you know working away weathering that rock for 
thousands of years. Um, so the deepest parts of rivers are often in those very picturesque settings um, at the base of a of a waterfall. Um, in which case, it's you know it's pretty safe um, as long as you're taking a you know a well timed jump. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't recommend it anywhere anywhere new. Um, you, you you alluded to pollution earlier, and I sorry I didn't didn't um, address that because that's the other that's the other thing that people often say. You know that that is a safety concern, um, and certainly people do get sick these days from swimming in rivers. It's usually a result of, of E. coli. Um, which is coming from our poo, which is in the rivers. I, I, remember, Dave, I remember David, sorry to interrupt, David Williams, when he did the, when he swam the Thames, mm. he was sick, wasn't he? Because mm. uh, Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been relatively lucky in all the years I was kayaking, you know, we, we call it river belly, you know, occasionally you'd, you'd, you'd get sick after a, a day on the water. Um, I've been relatively lucky, I, you know, tend not to swallow the water. Um, there's a few, you know, very, very few places where I have had the, the, the privilege to swim and literally be able to drink the river as I'm swimming. Um, but um, but yeah, that's not usually the case. Um, but I don't see it as a reason to stay out of the water. In fact, I'm I have a sort of stubborn streak. Um, and our rivers should not be full of shit. Um, and so by swimming them, I'm sort of I feel like I'm asserting my right to clean water. And more importantly than that, I'm asserting the right of all those creatures that don't have a choice you know all, all the fish and the wildlife the invertebrates um that live there that's you know that's their home and we are pumping our waste into it it's i mean it's it's revolting um so, so yeah um if i get sick um it will make me even more mad and i will i will channel the energy of that rage um into the campaign to to get things cleaned up I just, I, 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 maybe I see things very simply, but I just don't understand. I, I, I don't understand why people pollute rivers to the, in the scale that we've seen, to the scale we've seen even. It's really simple. It's money. Profit. Yeah, but I mean, this is, I, I just, I, I, I feel like an alien sometimes. I, th I think to myself, I look down and think, why are you doing that? Mm. You know what it's like out in space you know what are you doing that for <laughs> you know I, I yeah i mean it's that you know it's it's it, it's there's been a lot of focus on the water companies and the sewage that's popped into our rivers we also need to look at agriculture the the chemicals and the and the oh, silt yeah. that's washing off the land um that's a, a massive issue um but there are other forms of pollution as well the stuff that we're flushing down our toilets you know m most of it shouldn't be going there in the first place um you know you see these where I live, um, we, we, you know, it's, it's a rural area. Quite a few of us have septic tanks rather than mains drainage, um, and so you know, you only have to unbung your own sewage pipes once or twice, and you learn pretty fast you know, what's what flushes and what doesn't. Um, and so I guess there is that um, disposing of all our waste. There is that urge that that. that that feeling that oh that's nasty that's something that's unsanitary or I don't like it I don't want it anymore um, therefore I'll, I'll dispose of it and whether that's flushing it or putting it in a bin and having the um, the bin men take it away it, it's gone and we don't, I don't have to think about it anymore um, and we've got so used to doing that um, that we don't think about where it's going um, until you're swimming down a river and a you know a sanitary pad floats by you or a turd floats by you it's you know you think, oh, maybe we're getting that wrong. Again, um, it's one of those things that's never kind of highlighted on by the media, really, is it? Until it's too late. You know, it's just, again, it's an educational thing. Um, your book, um, as I say, is a fantastic uh, journey um, around rivers of the UK. What what's your process? How do you how do you write? How do you write a book? <laughs> um, my my personal process for this book like is, has been fairly um, idiosyncratic. It's the first book of its kind that I've written. All my previous books have been much more sort of straight natural history. Um, so the research has been much more desk based, um, book based, um, library based. Um, this one I've been writing my own life, I guess, um, into it a lot more. It's been much more experiential. Um, 
and I take copious voice notes. So I, so I, so I, I've traveled around, um, as you say, to various places, mostly around Britain, um, exploring different kinds of rivers um, to the ones I thought I knew. Um, so it wasn't just whitewater rivers. It was the, it was the, the tiny, tiny trickling streams and springs. It was the great, you know, the, the huge rivers, the, the seven and 10, um, the very slow rivers, the fast ones, you know, every, every sort I tried to kind of give a, um, an account of, of lots of different types of rivers, but I, I, I use the same technique as I use for writing my country diaries, or I, I go out, I immerse myself, um, and I take voice notes on my phone. Um, I have notebooks, but I tend to use them more um, at home when I'm out doing the field work. I take voice notes because it's quicker and it's easier to capture the moment. Um, the thoughts that flit through my head do so far too quickly for me to you know, make coherent written notes about them. And as soon as I start writing in a notebook, I start editing and composing um, and then miss what's going on around me. So um, so the, the, the phone, the smartphone is a fantastic invention for me. Um, and I've got thousands of hours, probably, or certainly hundreds of hours of, of just me chuntering away. <laughs> um, and I, I'll come back and I'll, I'll transcribe it. Um, and sometimes I, Sometimes I only realise afterwards what it is, what the point of it all is. But quite often I hear myself having that realisation when I'm when I'm when I'm talking to myself. I may have gone to a particular site for you know, to see one thing, um, but uh, but come away with you know, another conclusion. Um, and so it's a combination of you know what's what's been going on in my head and, and what what happens around me. Um, yeah, I would say that's that's the, te the technique, and I overwrite I, in terms in terms of volume. I, whether I'm writing a 360 word country diary or um, you know an 80,000 word book, I tend to write twice as much as I need and then chip away at it, which is very inefficient. Um, in the case of the flow, I wrote 200,000 words probably, and it ended up at 120 thousand so there's a lot on the cutting room floor um but that's not a bad thing i think it helps you you know keep in what's what's good um and this particular book was really impacted by the pandemic of course you know that the, the rough plan i had had to be revised um as i couldn't i couldn't travel um for those the, the middle period of the writing um not, not, not only could i not travel i couldn't write very much because i was um trying to school my son at home and this was a book that needed a lot of headspace so I ended up writing another book in between times um, that was easier to do in small chunks the um the, the tree a day book which I chatted to you about last time I think didn't I um but yeah that was that was easier to do um because it was it was short chunks um so with the flow I just thought when I realized how disrupted um the process was going to be I just thought well I'll just go where I can when I can um and write that write what happens so I ended up with this massive material and then the the last probably spent six months just trying to make sense of it all trying to hang it together in a in a way that felt coherent um because believe me for a long time it didn't um I'd got so much um so much material and it was so um it was such a it was such a mix of, of experience um mix of memoir and, and nature writing and history and mythology and polemic it was just you know I didn't I still don't really know what kind of book it is I've written um, it's got a bit of everything but I tried to, it was just trying to find a narrative structure that that held it together and in the end I just um tried to write it as a river would um you know let it let it flow from place to place um let it pool let it eddy let it um make those circles um those cycles that that water does um yeah <laughs> so i wouldn't necessarily rec recommend that as a, as a writing process but that that's how this one panned out are there any rivers around the world that you love um you mean other than in this country other than the uk yeah um and i've paddled i've paddled in um you know in places like um the Alps, the French Alps, the um, Austrian Alps, Switzerland, Slovenia, um, and then further afield, the Himalayas, um, and New Zealand has some spectacular whitewater rivers. Um, so I've had some, some thrilling times on those. Um, 
but I was sort of, I was kind of aware of even then just being there as a visitor you know we'd we'd we'd, we'd travel a lot to paddle um adventure tourism really um <clears throat> and that's something that you know I haven't flown for years now um a long haul anyway um um and I so I do feel differently about those kinds of trips um but um wouldn't say they they made a big impact on me absolutely they did but um but the in the British ones have in the course of writing this book and trying to pay more attention to them they've given me so much more than I expected you know I thought I might go and see some nice wildlife maybe learn a bit about um history and um but I found myself um finding my way back to a sense of where I'm from um the, the river the rivers have very much brought me home to um and 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 allowed me to kind of embrace my Britishness and my Englishness in a way that feels very natural very rooting um and has nothing to do with where I was born I wasn't born in this country I was born in Germany because my dad was in the army so I had a, I didn't really have a sense of um you know ancestry like, ancestry or, or, or birthright or anything like that um but yeah just just following the rivers and particularly the the the, the mythology associated with them um has just given me something something extra and I hope that that is available to anyone that that lives here um someone said to me where do you feel most at home and my idea of home is not linked to a place because I've lived in lots of different places it's it's linked to um, the feeling I get when I um, hug an oak tree or, or, or stare into a river, um, I feel at home in nature. Um, and, and, and that's that's a very um, privileged position to be in, I think. Um, I wish more people felt the same. Um, and again, that comes back to why, you know, why, why I campaign for a right to roam. I want more people to have that, that sense of, of belonging. Um, being part of something beautiful and immense yeah. and everlasting <laughs> yes it's you know it's it's a it's a sort of vaguely religious feeling i have about, about okay. nature so imagine the scene you're standing on a soapbox you're in high park corner with a megaphone what's your sales pitch to get the people who stand there and look at you to consider rivers I guess I talk about the water that comes out of their taps, um, passes through their body. That is the river running through them, um, and where it goes afterwards. It's just you don't have to think very long about that. I'm sure you know anyone that spends a lot of time sitting by a river, whether it's because they're a fisherman or just because they like that place. You just watch the water coming and, as you said, wondering about where it's come from and how it keeps coming um, and just follow it in your mind and think about all the myriad routes that water might take before in, you know, however many hundreds of thousands or millions of years, it comes back to another spot very like this, um, to pass through the body of an animal, something like you. Um, it's a sense of... Um, yeah, a sense of connection um, and water is one of the ways, one of the many ways we're connected. Um, I think of rivers and rivers and trees in a similar way um, in that both, both are a sort of model for, for um, the rootedness and for connectivity. You know, trees, trees are connected in ways that we've only recently begun to appreciate through the um, fungal networks that, that penetrate their roots, connect tree to tree or, or tree to other plants in the forest, um, but they also connect the, the deep earth and the underworld through the world of in which we live in, the world of life and, and light and, and and humanity up into the heavens so that we up there and regarded as, as sort of axis mundi world trees um, in, in times gone by and rivers do something very similar. Um, they, are, they are linkers of worlds. Yeah, just follow the water, I think. Um, and it can just be a purely mental exercise an imaginative exercise or you can do it for real um and and see you'll see wonders on your way 
a stupid question perhaps but have you a favorite wither and if you haven't that's not a problem but <laughs> um i do I, you always ask about favorite things and i yeah i uh, i think um at the moment my favorite river is, river is the feshi um in um in Scotland, it's a um, Glen Feshi, it's a tributary of the Spey um, in the Cairngorms. And it is, um, it's the whole Glen that has me captivated. Um, it's it's one of the estates uh, that are part of the, the wildland portfolio owned by um, Anders Paulsen, who's a, the, the Danish billionaire. Huge swathe of Scotland. It was the first one he bought um, and he has allowed it to Rear forest, they they they're rigorously culling the deer there, so the the trees are, are coming back. Um, they've done a lot of planting as well, um, and the river is allowed to be itself. There is not there's no constraint of it, so it just feels like um it feels like a river. I've never been to Yellowstone, but it has that vibe to it. It just feels incredibly dynamic. There are every time you go, the river slightly changed its course. It just strews boulders. It carves out um, landslides. Um, it's it's a river unchained um, and it's in this extraordinary resurgent landscape of trees where there are so many birds and fungi and invertebrates. Um, it's just an extraordinarily hopeful, invigorating place and it has the best mountain bothy in the country. Um, if you had a million pounds to spend on the environment, briefly, what would you do with it? I'd want to spend it connecting people, making people feel that they, um, not only that they belong, um, but they are custodians of the land. I think um, it would be tempting to buy land, um, but I, I, I have an issue with, with individuals owning vast quantities. You know, one of the things working with the right to roam has taught me is that ownership does not automatically confer um, an ability to be a good custodian. Um, the, the fact that we are, we are so depleted in, in, in nature in this country, um, to me, feels like it might be linked to the, the, the pattern of land ownership and the exclusion, because so much of the damage, the systemic damage is happening um, where we can't, you know, we can't see it. We can't see what's being done to our land. Um, so yeah, I would, I would spend it on, on access. Great answer. Okay, Zoomers, just to let you know that on the 28th of November, which is coming up because today's the 21st, I think, um, we have Florence Wilkinson and she's written a book about wildlife um, in our cities. And we're gonna be talking about wildlife in our cities. On the 5th of December, we've got Professor Frank Rene, who's gonna be talking about the secret life of the corncrake. And on the 12th of December, Connor Jameson, Connor, Connor Jameson even, <laughs> Connor Jameson, and he'll be speaking about the life of a naturalist called W.H. Hudson, which a lot of people haven't heard of, um, but he's really, he's like, for me, the original urban birder. Um, he's, he was Argentinian born and spent most of his time birding and talking about wildlife in London. So uh, that's on the 12th of December, and there's a ton more on the website, so check it out if you haven't uh, already and book on to these uh, talks and also join the uh, Umber the World community and you will actually get access to what's happening next, which will be the Q&A. So Amy, thank you so much uh, for sparing an hour tonight. We've had a really, I mean, I, again, I could just sit all night and chew the fat with you. Thank you for appearing again. I'm looking forward to seeing you um, again with your next book. <laughs> Better get busy then, huh? <laughs> Better next year, please. <laughs> and Zoomers. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And Zoomers, um, thank you again for your for being here. We couldn't have in conservation without you guys, so appreciate it. Until we meet again, you know what to do, guys. Keep looking up. <laughs>